Hey guys, before the episode, quick update from our end. We just released a video series called Tokyo Dreams. It's an all-access, behind-the-scenes vlog on Yanni, Dag, Vito, and Gabe Dean as they prepare for the Olympic trials. Watch it now on YouTube or on Instagram TV. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the, the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's Five percent of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time I spent wrestling, if it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Welcome back to the Wrestling Changed My Life podcast, folks. We're coming to you from Ithaca, New York. We're on Feet on the Ground here. We're producing a video series called Tokyo Dreams that's now live on YouTube. Check it out. But you're here for the podcast, so let's get to it. Guest today is Chael Sonnen, the original heel, UFC legend, wrestling All-American. He doesn't need an introduction from most people listening to this show. So let's get to the interview. Before we do, fan of the week, this one goes to my favorite set of brothers, the Jansen brothers, Corey and Jesse, Long Island's finest. Thank you for listening and all the support, gentlemen. As always, Wrestling Changed My Life is presented by Spartan Combat. Go to SpartanCombat.com to shop merchandise as well as to sign up for their national tournament coming up this May in Jacksonville, Florida. That's it, folks. Let's get to the interview with Chael Sonnen. I got to know, Chael Sonnen, welcome to the podcast, but I got to know, is it true that Coach Roy Pittman once ripped up a pair of Bulls tickets in front of the whole yes. team? Tell me that story. Yes. Front row center. Uh, okay, the way, the way I remember that, after practice, Bulls were in town. So this would have been a Monday, and I think the Bulls were coming on Wednesday. Something along these lines. But the practice before the night that the Bulls came on to take a, uh, the Trailblazers and Coach Pittman said, who wants to go to the game? A whole bunch of hands went up. And he was holding the tickets. And we started to say where the seats were, front row, center. I think they call it like half court or something. And a uh, b- bunch of hands go up. And then he keeps looking at the ticket and he says the time. He reads, well, you know, this is at 530. And practice starts at 530. So who's, who wants to go to the game? And not very many hands were still up. <laughs> and Pittman said, uh, so he ripped up the tickets and he said, you want to know why well, you're not going to go watch Jordan play? Because Jordan's not going to come watch you wrestle. That was it. Lesson learned, man. That's I, whatever, I mean, whatever that lesson was, it got through, man. I was nine years old, what 30 some years ago. I still remember him ripping up those tickets. That's a crazy story. And Michael Jordan still never come to watch us play. So <laughs> Coach Pittman was right, man. It just shows, uh, you know, I'm excited to talk to you for many reasons, but one to give some love to the Oregon wrestling community. I've had Dan Russell on the show He's a big Greco guy. I know you're a Greco guy. I don't think people realize how studly uh, Oregon was and still is, but certainly back in your day. You know, I appreciate that. We used to have, uh, there was some way to, to crown a national champion at the junior nationals. And I don't know how recognizable that was, but they did have a system and they would read off third, second, first. And two years, Oregon won it. In those two years, though, we had double champions, Oscar Wood, double champion, Isaac Wood, double champion, the late, great Kenny Cox, double champion. Uh, So, I mean, we had some real horsepower. And if you do go over the history of wrestling, I mean, we've got a handful of uh, world team members, a handful of Olympians. But um, we had guys right now, Ryan, two guys uh, that are Oregon guys who all American. We just couldn't keep them in state. Mm -hmm. 
and three or four seasons ago when I Brussler was there, uh, Berger out doing his thing in Nebraska. Uh, we had another one off in Illinois. Uh, Brunson was his name. Mm -hmm. All these guys were all Americans. They were all from Oregon. We just couldn't keep them in state. So that's been a bit of a challenge. The Pendleton era has begun. And so far, Coach Pendleton's keeping some of our better guys right here. Travis Whitlake, even this year, that's an Oregon kid, but he's representing Oklahoma State. Yeah, it's awesome to see Pendleton and Imar out there. Is there any hope for Oregon coming to their senses? University of Oregon. Limited. Limited, it does exist. Like here, a little, I'll give you an inside scoop, but they just built a new facility. And when they built it, Phil Knight told them to build it for a wrestling room. So they're not going to use it for wrestling right now, but they've actually spent the money and built it. This got finished about a year ago. So if wrestling, if you snapped your fingers and wrestled, you go roll some res light down on there. They've got the showers, the locker rooms, the space, the bike areas, the coach's office. They built a wrestling room for the future in case they want to bring it back. And look, that's a little bit promising, in my opinion. Tony Ramos was calling about it, saying, hey, Chael, you know anybody. I, I really like the way it looks out there in Oregon. I think once you start getting attracted by guys like Tony Ramos, because it, it could totally be a situation where chicken and egg, cart and horse, right, which comes first. Well, if we get the right Tony Ramos, by example, starts to put the right team together, we can go to the administration second. I'll help him do it. Mm-hmm. That's that's amazing that Phil Knight did that, though. I had no idea. That's exciting. Yeah. Well, I thought the same thing. You know, he doesn't tip his hat very much, even in the sport of football, which he loves. He really doesn't say a whole lot. He writes the big checks, and you know where he stands. But Phil never had anything against wrestling. In fact, you referenced Dan Russell a moment ago. But Phil made a wrestling shoe, and it was called the Dan Russell. It was called – and Russell was the first guy to ever have his shoe, let alone a Nike – and that shoe still sits on display. If you go down to Nike and Beaverton, the Dan Russell is still on display. And Phil didn't have any second guess or regrets about it. But the numbers are true. We, we have not done our job in fairness. I, every time I meet a wrestler and watch wrestling to come back, and I go, when's the last time you went to a college dual meet? He's got to get his calendar out and can't remember. I mean, the truth is we need to do a better job of showing up to these events and kicking in here or there. That's a big part of it, man. A lot of, a lot of wrestling guys don't go in uh... – and, and watch uh, in person, let alone online sometimes. You've been a lifelong wrestling fan, you know, from the jump, and you still are now. And I know your cousins were heavily involved, and they even wrestled for, uh, for Oregon in the, in the early 90s. But for the folks who don't know, just give us the 30-second commercial on how you got your initial interest in wrestling. Sure. I was a wrestling fan. I came from a wrestling family. My father, my cousins, the world, the, my cousins were my idols. They were all older than me. I was the youngest, so I looked up to these guys. Uh, their father, my uncle, was a wrestling coach. In fact, my first day of wrestling practice, I was being coached by my uncle, Rudy. And I still remember a breakdown that we learned in a, in a far <laughs> cradle that we learned some of those techniques. My uncle, Rudy, told me that uh, the best way to win is to cheat. And what we're going to do to cheat is we're going to do a lot of push-ups when the other guys aren't. We're going to get <laughs> strong. We're going to go use that. I was doing push-ups every night, you know, that, at that time, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. That's all you need to win the Olympics. So it just grew from there. I ended up, I think I liked wrestling more than my cousins did. They saw it all the way through. My cousin Ty was even a couple time all American for NAIA mm -hmm. in college. And my cousin Corey was division one, but he went on to win the PAC 10 championship and most outstanding. So I, I, we had good levels of success, but I wanted to go further. I mean, I like the Greco Roman stuff, but I like the freestyle. I wanted to try to get over to Cuba and test myself against them. And so I, I liked it or was committed maybe a little uh, higher level than them, but that was just to try to impress them. I mean, again, yeah, these are the guys that I looked up to. Yeah, no, it's, it's cool when you have that kind of lineage in the family and then you take it a step further, just getting into your college career a little bit, 97, you're a freshman, take fifth at the pac tens. You got a phone call on like the Monday, I think, before, and you ended up getting a wild card bid. I mean, what kind of like life or death experience was that like your freshman year in college? Okay, so get a load of this. And I should have been wild carded. I should have been. I, I mean, I had pin guys in the top 20 and pin guys that are going, but that's not totally how it works when you're a freshman. There's a little bit of politics. If somebody was in a similar argument as I did with some pretty notable wins here, but he's a senior, there is a human element where you give him if it's his last chance. So that, that kind of bit me, but I was done. And I get a phone call. I'm in. It was a guy named uh, uh, surplus out of Boise state. He hurt his knee. He couldn't go. 
So I fly in, you know, that's all postseason. So the NCAA pays for that, not the school. It's a totally different uh, feel when you go to the NCAAs. But I'm there. Guess what? Surplus is there. I'm, I get up, I get to the weigh-ins to weigh in. I see Todd Surplus, who is the guy that I'm allegedly replacing. I went over to Coach Finley. I said, Coach, I'm replacing Surplus, right? He said, yeah. So Surplus has his sheet in his hand, and he's in his underwear. He's about to weigh in. <laughs> so I actually weighed in as well, and they had me. They were ready for me. They had me registered. I'd been processed and everything, and they didn't put me in the bracket. So I didn't know that. I'm part. very happy for Surplus, right? I, I don't want a guy to have to be hurt. Yeah. I was happy for Surplus that he got the chance, but I don't know how they fumbled it so badly that they bought a plane ticket for me, got me a hotel, which again, that's the NCAA and had me registered to get a bout sheet. All these errors happened though. I weighed in and now I got to go home. That was embarrassing. Dang. Did you get to that's watch not. the wrestling at least or no? Oh, I got out of there so fast. I didn't know what I was doing back then. I was, I was 18 or 19 years old. I knew I had to get something. I'd only seen it on TV, but it's called a taxi. So there was, of course, no smartphones or internet or what. So I get a yellow pages and I come across something close enough called taxidermist. So I call the taxidermist to come get me. And he is the one that explains to me the difference between taxi and taxidermist. So that unless you're an animal and you want to stuff to put on a wall, you've called the wrong number. I finally find a yellow cab service. And I didn't, I didn't even tell the coaches goodbye. It was a three hour drive to get to the airport. I didn't tell anyone I was leaving. I left at midnight. By the time they woke up, I was back home. Jeez. That's crazy because that 97 nationals was one of the most historic ever with, with Iowa and Oklahoma state battling it out at the UNI dome in Cedar falls. So it's, it's not surprising. that just not a lot of taxis in Cedar falls back in those days. That's cr <laughs> yeah, true. That's crazy. I thought you wrestled at it. And probably not surprised how easy it was to find a taxi dirt. <laughs> exactly. A lot of hunters out in those parts. So at that same time, just per uh, like sure dog, you got your first MMA fight in 97. And I've always wanted to ask you this. Why such a break between 97 and when you really went gung ho with the fighting? Okay. So I was in 1997. I had been doing a lot of training. I finally found a match and it's super, super hard to get matches. And Ryan, that's even a uh, kind of a true st statement now, uh, not just in the big dogs, say the UFC, by example, Bellator, by example, not just with them to find a match anywhere. It's not like a wrestling meet where you show up, you weigh in a whole bunch of other kids will too. And we'll figure it out as the day goes on. You're not guaranteed a match and you can sit and beg for matches. You're not guaranteed one. So to get on the radar, to be able to break into some local promoters, uh, matchmaking mindset in meetings and get your name on the ticket it was just hard to do. So I just wanted to get started quickly. So I didn't really want to do this till post-college, but my sophomore year, I said, man, there's an opportunity. It's going to be some of the right guys there. There's a guy named Matt Hume put it on, but he was partnered with a guy named Maurice Smith, who mm -hmm. was the current uh, heavyweight champion. I thought this is just a good opportunity. I got to go uh, be seen by these guys. And that's what made me uh, I drove home from college, grabbed my mother. My dad would have come, but he didn't understand what we were doing because it was called pancreation. Yeah. So I kept telling him we're doing pancreation. And he, I don't want to watch that. I don't know what that is. So then when I came home and it was a straight fist fight, he watched it about eight times. He was so mad at me that I didn't take him. I said, Dad, you were invited. <laughs> is pancreation the one where Boss Root needs to hit people with the palms of his hand? Yes. Yes. Very good memory. Got it. Pancreation used to be an Olympic sport, just by example, not modern times, but it used to be. So when they took elements of pancreation and allowed it to stay, whether that's the boxing, taekwondo, judo, wrestling, they allowed elements, but pancreation as a whole, they took away. And the true meaning of mixed martial arts, that, uh, that, that came along to pass a law in Nevada in 2001. Mixed martial arts never needed to be called mixed martial arts because it is the sport of pancreation. Mm. Pancreation is where you put all the martial arts together. Don't bite. Don't headbutt. Figure it out. Really? I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Man, there's there's so much. Those early days, you know, I grew up in the Quad Cities uh, near the Militage Academy, and one of my cousins, Steve Russ, cornered um, Tim Sylvia quite a bit. So we were pretty cued in at an early age, probably like high school, to watching some of those UFC cards. But I tell people this watching UFC back then was like talking about porn. No one wanted to do it. It was just, it was so off topic. It was insane. And you were in it from those early days. Now. I mean, how do you even describe the change from the early two thousands to what we're seeing now with this phenomena? 
Well, that's a very fair example that you gave because you really didn't want people to know that you were doing it or know that you were a fan of it. And, and even if they were, you kind of kept down until yeah. you made eye contact. I mean, I could just remember getting my hair cut. Go get my hair cut and the gal cut my hair. What do you do? And I never once said UFC or MMA. I tried that somewhere along the line, but I mean, I quit because it turned into, oh, is that like wrestling? Oh, is that on Monday nights? Oh, do you know uh, Randy Orton? You know, <laughs> it kind of just turned into one of these things. And uh, I just stopped doing it. And I just started to, uh, switched over to start saying, I'm a sports guy. Yeah, what do you do? I just changed the topic. But I bring that to you because about eight years ago, I went back. I gave it another shot. I said, I'm in the UFC. They knew exactly what it was. Says my son watches it all the time. We'll keep our eye out for you in the future. So it did finally catch up this thing that used to be dark and almost embarrassing because of some of the connotations it brought with it. No, man, we, we can have pride and hold our head high now. Yeah, it's it's so it's crazy how different it is. I mean, even looking back to I had to rewatch uh, the Matt Lindland, um, Pat Militich fight just in honor of this this podcast, because I know Lindland big coach years. I don't know how you got involved with him, but um, maybe just share the story of kind of his evolution into your game of MMA. Well, Matt Linlin graduated from Nebraska. And to remind you of Matt's senior year, he was 36 and 0, big eight champion, number one seed going into the NCAA tournament. If you lost your first match at the NCAAs back then, the guy that beat you not only had to win his next match, he had to go all the way to the finals. <laughs> if that happened, then you could get pulled back in. Matt, who never lost, got upset by Earl Hall. Uh, Earl Hall lost his next match. That eliminated Matt. So the Big Eight champion, 36-1 and one on the season out of the tournament. Disgusting how they did it. But at any rate, so Matt was a big deal because he's an Oregon guy. So he won a national championship for the community college out here. So when he went to Nebraska, all of us fans went with him. When he returned home, he wanted to coach. He came to my high school. My head coach, Dave Sandville, put Matt on the, the coaching staff. And this was Matt's first foray into coaching. All the while, he still got his own aspirations of U.S. Opens, World Team Trials, Olympic Games. So he was a great example to just watch. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you could just, if you could just keep up with Matt Lindland, if you can do as many sprints as him, if you can move the dumbbells as many times as this guy does, good things will happen to you. And I went from not placing in the state, meeting Matt Lindland, being in the junior national finals that year, a guy that couldn't place in state. I'm now wrestling for the national title. It really was that training with Matt Lillard. It was just a different mindset mm. more than anything else. Matt expected to win and he couldn't understand how you would not expect to win. And that was way before he had his Olympic run then if it's high school age for you, right? Yes. Yes, Matt Matt tried for the team in 96. He lost to Gordy Morgan. Mm -hmm. But yes, then Matt went all the way through, made every world team after that, the actual Olympics uh, in 2000, left the sport of wrestling, got fully engaged in fighting, shows up to the U.S. Open in a weight class he'd never even competed in before, uh, ends up winning that, making the team and getting a silver medal in that weight class. Matt is one of the great Greco wrestlers ever for this one simple argument. He has two medals in two different weight classes and freestyle mm, pretty uncommon, but Greco completely never been done before. Matt Lindland, two trips to the world finals, two different weight classes. And nobody gives him credit for that. I don't know why. That's incredible. And, and Greco in general, you know, isn't getting a lot of love right now. Uh, back in, you know, my, when I was just getting into wrestling guys like Brad Varing, who were, I think he was a national champ for Nebraska. He was getting involved with Greco. You know, what do you think, uh, you know, how, what's the reason for that? Or, or how does Greco get a, get a little bit of a boost here in the country? Well, and you know, I see, I don't know that I have ever seen an NCAA, NCAA division one, all American try Greco and not have a huge level of success. Mm. I mean, uh, Brandon Reese comes to mind. One of Brad's training partners, Brad, of course, being the national champion. But when those guys switched to Greco, they had a pace. They had an ability to pummel. They had an ability to go a little bit harder than their opponent. And that's, that is a reality. If you're in a collegiate room, a collegiate room will get you in the best shape humanly possible to then go do freestyle and Greco. It all, almost make freestyle and Greco seem easy in comparison to the college pace. So I think that's something they had in their advantage. Rulon Gardner and all the greats, the biggest upset in the history. He, he beats Corella. But Rulon was in the Greco, the collegiate room, every single day. 
And it, I, most guys that, that do well in collegiate mentally think, well, then it's going to transition to freestyle. And it does. It makes a very nice transition. I just see it making a bigger and more impactful splash right away when they go over to Greco. Kyle Dake. Kyle Dake playing around did one Greco match two years ago. It happened to be against the world champion. Yeah. Score yeah. was five to three. Dake doesn't even know what he's doing. And he's only two points behind the best in the world. I just share for you. We've got some guys that could win Greco medals right now. For whatever reason, that doesn't interest them. It's kind of like those guys where um, I've heard DC say this. Like if you're one of the top three freestyle guys, stay and try to make a team. If not, go to UFC. But that same token, like if you're four through seven at a really deep weight, why not switch over to Greco? It seems like a pride thing almost. I don't know. It's odd to me. No, I think so too. I, I never felt it. Like I, I used to live at the Olympic Training Center for a period of time uh, in 2000, trying to get ready for the trials. <clears throat> and there was never a stigma. There was never the freestyle guys or the cool guys or the Greco guys or the second tier guys. Some of that would be true. Mm -hmm. Many of the guys that go into the Greco scene either had some injury that prevented them, you know, a knee injury. Dave Zuniga hurts his knee so bad he's, he's got to leave freestyle and go over to, yeah. to Greco yeah. just to offer a name. So I realize there is some truth to that, but there nobody looks down on anybody. There was nothing of that regard. Every now and then you'll have the freestyle guy that will refer to Greco as half man wrestling because you're only wrestling half the man. I've never fully got the joke myself. And I'll tell you this. It's always been the Greco guys that go on into MMA and go further. And I don't suggest that's because the Greco guys are a superior athlete. It's just a posture issue. Greco posture and fighting posture is the same thing. With freestyle guy, it takes, it takes a little bit of adjustment. Sure. So sure. I would offer that uh, for you as well. If you're looking to peer combat and something that's going to uh, transition over, some of those good clinches, understanding underhooks, understanding protection, uh, security on arms, on heads, Greco can come in very handy in a cage fight. Yeah, and we've seen it in, uh, in UFC over the years. Now, I know you're an avid wrestling fan still. We're in an Olympic year, which is a, a special time to be a wrestling fan. Olympic trials are next weekend. It's just one of the deepest that I can remember. Um, if you had to pick a matchup or two you're really looking forward to, Chell, what's it going to be? Okay, the two big ones. Uh, and we got to get there, but of course is Burroughs, Dake, or is the bigger one, Schneider, Cox. And... Before we make believe that those are going to happen, I mean, there's a guy named Imar who, <laughs> who has other ideas, right? I mean, I just offer for you that there's going to be some resistance to, and the boys aren't going to just lay down. But if we could get the two out of three trilogy going, those matches, I would definitely have a popcorn, nice big Coca-Cola, and, and I would really enjoy myself. There's no way to go wrong at the trials. The trials is iron on top of iron. It's uh, their dream matches. They're the ones you sit around and argue, what would happen if this guy wrestled this guy? And then the announcer, they're up. And then once they're done, being up, they're up 20 minutes later. And then they're up 20 minutes again. Even the wrestlebacks, you know, the wrestlebacks are very important at the trials because these guys are all coaches or want to be coaches that always tell their team how important the wrestlebacks are. Mm. But when they get put in that position themselves, it's not unanimously we're going to pass this test. Some of them are just not mentally tough to do it. And they have to show the world. They have to show their students and their fellow coaches. I, I couldn't come back. But the guys that do, you know, even the consolation semis or the Consi semis or the bronze medal match in the wrestlebacks in a worst case scenario is going to have an Olympian. In this particular year, the wrestleback is going to have a world or Olympic medalist. It's just silly to even think about how, how that's even possible. I think it's an absolute travesty that we have six weight classes for the Olympics and there's 10 otherwise, but that's a whole other can of worms. Um, but yeah, I, I was telling my girlfriend the other night, just the stakes are so high. I mean, like, I'm going behind the scenes and following the Cornell guys. I'm leaving actually tomorrow for it. I'm just going to be filming kind of like a UFC embedded episode, but just on the Cornell. For the last chance? Uh, for, for the, last chance? For the uh, trials. Okay. Yeah, because I land in Ithaca on Sunday, and then I'm in Ith or I land in Ithaca on Saturday, and then Sunday, Monday, Tuesday will be in Ithaca, and then flying to Texas Tuesday. Okay, I like that, but you don't know. You don't even know how many Cornell guys will be there. I mean, I just found this out that Gabe Dean has to go through the last chance qualifier. I'm so pissed about Excuse it. Me. I'm like, you want? I, I, I was talking Excuse to him. Me. I'm like, dude. I watched. I watched the U.S. Open. He won the <laughs> U.S. Know. Open. How? When? When did they put in the U.S. Open? Doesn't count for the trials. What was the point of the U.S. Open then? I couldn't believe That's it. A ridiculous decision. How did we get here? 
It's just another uh, thing that really makes you wonder what the hell was going on. But to your point, Gabe's not going to be there for the first three days. And he's like the fourth co-star in this in this show I'm filming. And I didn't even know it until like two weeks ago because I'm like, I watched you win in Iowa City in September um, at the Senior Nationals. And he's like, yeah, apparently, yeah, I guess they had announced it ahead of time that they're not going to count that because. The- but Ryan, what was the reasoning for that? I mean, sincerely, I obviously missed yeah. something. If they didn't count that, that used to be the bulk of it. And and then phase two, uh, if you're a medalist from the past quad, a phase three, if you win the NCAAs and phase four, maybe the university nationals count. I don't know. Where did the bulk come from? What tournament did they turn to and say, okay, top six? The 2019, what tournament? The 2019 senior nationals. They, okay, okay, they went to the 2019, not the 2020. Yeah. So instead of taking the most recent, they took the latter. I, I halfway get that, and I like opportunity. If somebody's saying because of the way the world was in a pandemic and I couldn't get to the tournament, I wouldn't want him blackballed. But wouldn't you just take both? What's wrong with taking both? What's wrong with more opportunity? Why would anybody show up to this year's nationals? What was the motivation for those guys to be there? Just matches? It must have been. Yeah, it must have been because – it's, it's kind of baffling to me. I mean, even if you take usually like the U S open, it's like top eight go, but even if you take the top two, you at least put them in there. But now, uh, Nate Jackson and Gabe Dean are going to be in a freaking minefield of guys at 86. Sure. I mean, that weight class is insane. Um, insane. I, I noticed that, uh, Dean Heil has, uh, yet to qualify. He's got to go in there yeah. at, at 45 and a half. And by the way, I'm looking at the last chance qualifier. He is not what I would consider the favorite. He's going to have to go through some hammers. A two-time NCAA champion is going to have to go through some very good day of wrestling just to be able to enter the trials. My goodness. We need more opportunity for these guys. These guys are heroes. What they're about to go do, these guys are heroes, and nobody recognizes it, Ryan. I think I think that you and I, maybe we're failing at telling the, their stories. Yeah. Maybe we're failing at, at letting people know the, the trying times, everything that Gabe Dean had to go through. Now I find out Gabe Dean did it. Best guys uh, in the country, four of them in one day. What was his reward? You're going to the last <laughs> chance? Wow. Jeez. <laughs> That's a tough guy, Gabe Dean. Oh, he's the man. He he is fantastic. I I love uh, talking to him, spending time with him. He's just a guy like you want. If you if your son grows up to be like Gabe Dean, you're, uh, you're aces. So, like, I, he's just one of the good guys in the sport. But the crazy thing is that the NCAA champs from last weekend, they're qualified. So... I had to ask you about this guy because he reminds me a lot about you. The great AJ Ferrari could be a five timer. Just tell us your thoughts on watching this guy just really plow through the competition at a at a really senior weight class. I loved it. I loved it, and I thought it was entertaining watching his style. I mean, he is a real goer. There was no point in a match, including head to head with Iowa, where the Iowa effect was going to work on him, wear him down, get him tired. He won't be here. The last thirty seconds, we're going to get to him. Excuse me. He was the one coming at you in the last 30 seconds, his build, his physique. You know, he had made a comment. I got to take the guy at his word. Cause I don't know him. I thought he was sincere. He said, he'll never be a 97 pounder again. He's going to heavyweight. Now, if you could imagine that that's true. And you imagine that uh, Gable comes back next year. We, I think we could have the biggest match in wrestling history, which officially is Gwiz versus Schneider. That's an official number by ESPN ratings. Nobody would watch that match more than any match in history. I really think that AJ versus Gable uh, would do it. And before we get into the X's and O's of that match, I just like the mere fact that he said, look, I'm a big guy. I did this one time. I'm going to go up here. He really does appear to be fearless. It's one thing to talk tough. It's another thing to walk out there time and time again. I think that he would walk out there. I think if we were going to get these guys and just do a good charity match today, I think he's a lot more likely to show up than Gable is. I I just feel as though Gable would have some reason to not be there. I don't know that is uh, (laughs) true, but Gable's got some hard work cut out for him. And as good as he has been looking, you start to juxtapose that against a possible two out of three with Gwizdowski. I don't think that anything is set in stone at those weight classes. No. And I, uh, I put out there on Twitter that I think Gable could be an Olympic champ and I got torched, but I still think it's true. I mean, Gable, I, st- I think Gable should be the Hodge. And, and I even said, even if Spencer had both ACLs, I still think Gable's the Hodge. The weight class is just much deeper, but you could also say for, you know, for Ferrari was undefeated too. So, um, brings me to a question. I was going to ask you, who would you name Hodge this year? Yeah, for, for Hodge, I would definitely go with Gable as well. Okay. Uh, you, know, you understand, in the finals, he didn't just beat a big, good athlete. He beat a world champion. 
Mm -hmm. And I I never ceases to amaze me how quickly the NCAA wants to dismiss USAW recognition. If you're not going to recognize that he's a world champion that was just beaten by a world champion, because that's what Gable, you're not going to recognize uh, Casprioli, I believe, has a medal of some degree. And I know Colton Schultz has several. Colton Schultz also very likely to make this year's Olympic team. He's only fourth in the the weight division. So Mm -hmm. I don't think we've got any depth anywhere. I'd have to go all the way back to like a 97, 98 when Lesnar was in there and Stephen Neal was in there and Jason Gleesman, who was an Olympian at 220 pounds. Remember when that class used to exist? And he, I mean, it was iron. Gary McCoy. Garrett Lowney. And, you know, they were just going to keep that, that heavyweight on fire. Sheldon Benjamin. I mean, that era was really something special right now. I fully agree with you. If, if you've got three and four age group world medals in a division and one guy comes out on top, he wins the Hodge. Yeah. And you didn't even mention, you know, Kirkley from Penn State. He's another freak. I mean, he could easily be up there. It's just loaded. Thank you. Thank you. He, I think he's the best. Yeah. I think that he's the best. Somebody told me he was hurt. Like, I think just move for move and skill for skill at that weight class. I'm seeing somebody told me that he is that accurate because he wrestled. He looked like he slowed down, but I never saw him doing the baby. You know, I never saw him trying to like tell the story, the Virginia kid that, that was the champion that, that bailed out. But I mean, he was telling the story to the audience yeah. for an hour before he finally bailed out. I didn't see Kirkle Vickle Schmickle <laughs> didn't do anything. No, he looked a little slower out there, but he held his head high. He took care of business. Ellie, he's good. He's he good pounds he's a good wrestler yeah he's he's uh freaky talented i could see a you know a number of futures for him but i didn't even know he's hurt until i read a tweet about his his dad had throw a tweet out there that he had been injured and not even on the mat except for like the last four weeks and so i mean i just don't i don't think i can remember a weight class as deep as that i mean like a heavyweight like we said you had kara mccoy Stephen neal in the 2000s but man uh, it's deep now I know we're winding down here, but a couple last questions as we, anytime we come out of the college season, there's always the topic of rule changes. Now you've made a living in MMA where there's virtually no rules. What if any rules would you recommend to folk style or freestyle? I will tell you, I have been so happy with the way UWW has done such a good job, at least in comparison to Fila. Remember those Uh, dirty, the ball drop. That was horrible. There were a bunch of uh, uh, old judo guys getting drunk and writing rules <laughs> here to it. They were stealing for a feel. It was so bad. UWW has done so good. They changed the rules so many times. I mean, they got at one point along the way where it was more of like a poker game. Like if you have a four and he only has a two, or if you have two fours and he's got two, <laughs> three, the whole thing got weird. And then you don't just win the round. You got to win two rounds. It's the best of three, unless he doesn't score. The, I'm scratching my head going, what are you doing here? And that era changed it because wrestling is a sport of the tough guy. They took the tough guy out of it. All of a sudden, a good, solid athlete was coming in and winning all of the medals. Wrestling needed to find its toughness back. Make sure you make this about grit somehow. And there is a way to do it. A four-minute match isn't house. So now they're back to the way that they should be. Little breather in between. I love the fact that after six minutes, it's settled. And many people don't like that. They think there should be some kind of rule all the way down to a coin toss. I disagree. I think you're looking at it from a fan standpoint instead of the competitor. If you are a competitor and you've got to take on the five baddest dudes on earth today, you have to kind of know how long can it be in a worst case scenario. Mm. I have seen tournaments changed back in the old day when you get to overtime, it's first one to score wins and they go like another 12 minutes. It's amazing. It's a marathon match, but you can throw both guys out of the tournament because they can't go on. They're going to be too tired right now. I think there's an importance to having that six minutes. I really, really like the way wrestling's done. And frankly, even the logistics of the video replay, there used to be a time not very many refs would change their own call and there was never any proof that they had to. Now you're going to prove it Mm -hmm. and you're going to stand on it. We're going to make the best judges and best decisions that we can with the technology and information we have. That sounds fair to me. They still, they still screw up. Remember the crotch lift, uh, Yanni and Zane. And, and Zane, they still screw that thing up, even with instant replay and a very basic technique, but that's life. I think all in all, Ryan, I got to tell you, I like it the way it is. So you're on record supporting criteria. That's, I did not think you would be a criteria, man. You like it six, six. Okay. That's uh. Oh. What about writing time for folk style? Keep it or leave it? 
Oh, definitely keep it. Yes, okay. it's one of the few that they have. And, you know, when talk about a little MMA, yeah. but, you know, I'm an MMA guy. I'm a wrestler at heart, but I went on in my, my career and my living in MMA. And I will just tell you, it's not wrestlers that have done well in MMA or are doing well in MMA. That is historically false. Mm. It is American wrestlers, specifically because of the takedown knowing to hold a man down against his will or vice versa, you get taken down, force it uh, to get up and get free with a guy on top of you. Who's a trained killer mm. who doesn't want you free. The stand up and the ride is what separates up. That's the toughness. That's why it's not wrestlers that dominate mixed martial arts. It's American wrestlers. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. I mean, the, the control aspect of it is something you see whenever a, a non-wrestler gets taken down. They get that look in their eyes so they can't go anywhere. So, okay, you're uh, you're keeping it. Um, last question for you, Chael, is if you're a wrestler right now, like a, a college stud, like any of the Spencer Lees of the world or anyone in that caliber, what are you doing to market yourself? And this is a question from Twitter. Oh, Oh, I will tell you, it's very hard to go wrong. It's really hard to go wrong. The one encouragement that they would need, particularly at that age, when it comes to reading things, don't ever believe it. That doesn't mean don't, don't believe the things that are negative. Because it'll hurt your feelings. Don't believe the positives. If, you're, if they're saying you're unbeatable and you're the greatest, as soon as you believe it, you now have a problem. Mm. Now you're going to change something. Now you're going to train a little bit differently. Now you're not going to want it quite as much. You can't believe that stuff, but the same goes for negative. Okay. The whole reason those things are set up is for interaction. And yes, a lot of it is negative interaction. And uh, Spencer Lee, two seasons ago, Midlands deleted his entire Twitter account. And I couldn't believe him. The baddest dude in the world had something said to him by a complete stranger who would never walk up and say it to his face. And it hurt his feelings. I was surprised but he's also a young man. Mm -hmm. And so I can see where these things happen, but basically I mean, it's one of the two. If you can't take it, stay the hell off of it. But if you're out there doing social media and you got, you, you've got some kind of a gimmick like Ferrari, you know, Ferrari's gimmick and he got his shirt off at all times. <laughs> he will find a reason to have his shirt off. He will find, he will find a reason. It, it's hilarious. The whole thing's funny, you know, and not to mention he doesn't back down and he doesn't say, sorry. I remember when Ferrari got into it with Gable and Gable was trying to come back. He said, Kid, I eat steak bigger than you. Like, okay, sure. You know, the steak line. It's, but he tried. Gable tried. Ferrari didn't back down. Ferrari said, I'm coming for you. And, and that's what it has to be. That's how you have to talk if you want this real interest. I mean, truly, if Ferrari and Gable were to get together, we would make that. That would be a mega match, particularly if, uh, you know, they did it in the Division One, so we all had a year to build it. Yeah. Change the records of wrestling. It's a mega match. I was also saying the first time Ferrari steps foot in Carver Hawkeye, that's going to be all time electricity um, because no one hates Iowa more than John Smith. And I got to think that secretly John Smith loves the way that, well, at first I was torn if he likes the way Ferrari carries himself, but now I think he kind of likes it. Um, and I just, I can't wait until Ferrari steps into Carver for the first time. Well, Chael, I really appreciate your time today. This has been a lot of fun. I did just want to say thank you for making the uh, the YouTube video, reviewing the podcast. I get people messaging me all the time about that. Really appreciate that. That's it for this episode of Wrestling Changed My Life. Thank you so much for tuning in, folks. As always, thank you to our sponsor, Spartan Combat. They're hosting a national tournament in Jacksonville, Florida, May 20th through the 23rd. You can register now at SpartanCombat.com. To watch the video interview of this episode, go to Wrestling Changed My Life on YouTube. You can also see the clips on Instagram and Twitter at Wrestling Changed My Life. That's it, folks. We'll see you next time.